Good morning, everyone. I am Saurav Singh, co-founder and director of Rare Diseases India Foundation. It is my pleasure to welcome our chief guest, speaker, moderator, and all the attendees today who are watching us from different locations of India and abroad. We are very grateful to Sanofi Genjain for supporting us for this great cause. I also thank to our strategic partner, Akmeri, to come forward. As we all know that, Rare Disease India Foundation is a patient advocacy group. It is established in 2019, and this is a non-profit organization. It works for the benefits of the patients suffering from rare diseases and to raise awareness about rare diseases in the country. We also know that in the month of March 2021, Government of India has come up with a revised rare disease policy. In this policy, government has divided the rare diseases in three groups. Group one, it is for one-time curative treatment. Group two, lifetime treatment, but lower cost. And group three, lifetime treatment, but cost is very high. As for the policy, government of India denied fully finance for the treatment of high cost rare diseases, which falls under group three diseases. Government of India has made a crowdfunding platform and requested individual and corporate donors willing to support treatment for such patients Ministry of Corporate Affairs is also requested to encourage ESUs and corporate houses to contribute as per the Companies Act, as well as the provisions of Companies Rules 2014, Corporate Social Responsibility Rules. To discuss in details about today's topic, the role of CSR in rare diseases, uh, I welcome our keynote speaker and chief guest, respected Mr. Ratandeep Saxena, Mr. Saxena is the lead CSR and director of New Generation RCGP Rotary International, has very vast experience in the field of corporate social responsibility. I also welcome our eminent speaker, Dr. Atanu Kumar Datta from Department of Biotechnology from AIMS Kalyani, West Bengal. And last but not the least, most welcome to Dr. Snehal Malaka Mumi. She is clinical genetics in Apollo Hospital, Navi Mumbai. I would request Dr. Snehal to moderate this session today. Over to you, Dr. Snehal. Thank you, Saurabh. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Rare Disease India Foundation. And uh, I welcome our chief guest today, uh, Mr. Sandeep Saxena. I welcome our speaker today, um, Dr. Atan Kumar Datta. Uh, as uh, Mr. Saurabh has already introduced, uh, Mr. Sarabh, Sandeep Saxena is a very active uh, Rotary International District uh, uh, Chief, a Director New Generation RCGP, and a lead in CSR Partnership in ActionAid. Uh, so um, he is the best person to approach today that how can we uh, you know, distribute and diverse our funds, especially when it comes to rare disease India. And uh, Dr. Atanu Kumar Datta is um, with a background of biochemistry. He is interested in clinical genetics and molecular genetics and has a training in, uh, uh, in genetics in fellowship and currently at uh, AIMS Kalyani. So um, uh, just to brief, uh, and um, Mr. Saurav has already said that rare disease India policy, which has come now, uh, and it encompasses because uh, there were so many obstacles and hurdles when it comes to rare disease India, uh, right from detection, diagnosis, awareness, treatment, management in various fields. And um, in India, um, we are at one end where we are formulating rare disease India policy, where we are um, arranging CSR and crowd funds. And at one end, we are, uh, you know, uh, we have areas, uh, still there is a lack of awareness, still there is um, lack of pickup of cases at various pockets uh, where uh, even doctors are not aware how to pick it up early. So we are at two ends in India. And uh, to join these aims, we really need efforts, uh, human resources, we need funds, and we need a lot of research and scientific backup. So we have to take together, and of course the backbone is um, the funds uh, everywhere. And uh, this is how, and we have to ensure that uh, through this rare disease policy that we utilize these funds in a very, um, uh, what we say as a, uh, uh, it, it, will, it should benefit patients, it should benefit doctors and a society as a whole. Uh, 
Uh, it's not that uh, just out of uh, in a research interest, the funds are being diverted somewhere or out of treatment, because sometimes the treatments are so uh, expensive. Uh, then uh, in India, we have to balance it out, whether we have to really support this treatment where we are lacking funds in uh, very crucial areas like nutrition still. So we have such a diverse views and it becomes difficult for people working in rare disease community like us doctors that why we are focusing on this treatment, why we are behind this getting these funds. So we need some third party like uh, who NGOs and rare disease foundations and people working with uh, diverse communities like uh, Rotary International when they can view uh, from above that in which areas they can support in rare diseases. We have so many rare diseases. So first challenge in India is we don't have a research data which we can rely on. So first thing is we have to make doctors aware how can we collect data because basics of research and treatment which uh, Western society is always advanced in, be it vaccines, be it treatment, be it uh, whatever new molecules coming up, is the basis is data. They, uh, they come up with their own data that this is the incidence, this is a prevalence, and that is how these much funds are required. And we don't have, even we don't have data for congenital hypothyroidism, say, in various pockets of India. Uh, so we can't say that which uh, community we have to more support for uh, awareness of hypothyroidism and which community is almost already uh, knows about uh, congenital hypothyroidism and already screened. Like many, uh, this, many hospitals in urban areas have already started screening for congenital hypothyroidism, but we, where it is almost required, it is not yet reached. So um, right from diseases like congenital hypothyroidism, which is so basic, where mental retardation can be prevented uh, to 100% when it detected early, to a disease which is very complicated, needs a lot of efforts to get uh, treatment like spinal muscular atrophy, a lot of funds and a lot of um, uh, awareness. So we have to, uh, so the role of CSR comes when first is to have awareness amongst the doctors, uh, to connect to the international community when it comes to their expertise here. So arranging uh, some funds, when we have to get some experts advising us because many of such foundations also uh, they demand um, they demand their support uh, for their educational activities. So role of CSR is not only limited only for treatment. So getting this uh, expertise here to guide doctors here. So arranging such events and also um, setting up basic facilities for screening. So be it clinical screening, be it uh, laboratory screening. Laboratory of course. Not all expertise in genetics or rare diseases can be uh, diversified, seeing the, um, uh, seeing the accuracy it needs. But uh, a very basic testing, a very basic clinical screening, say clinical awareness and training for doctors, um, getting this rare disease awareness and screening into curriculum right from MBBS. So right from MBBS doctors and uh, primary healthcare workers, how can we inculcate this training? So utilizing funds there and then clinical screening, laboratory screening, and how to easen out the platform so that this uh, diagnostics reaches out to uh, various, uh, various specialties. So I think um, uh, I would like to um, uh, hear views of our speaker today, uh, our uh, guest today, that how can we uh, gather all these uh, things together and uh, what views they have to put forth uh, and then we can have, uh, you know, a communication, free communication or uh, some uh, views from viewers. So I would like to first, I think, uh, uh, Mr. Saurav, first we have, we, we are uh, having a talk today, right? Or we'd like our chief guest to uh, have his views. How, how are we going to? Yes, Mr. Saurav. Over to you. Yeah, uh, I would request Mr. Uh, Sudip Saxena to uh, speak something about this. Thank you, Saurabhji. Thank you, Dr. Snehal Patanuji. I think, uh, first of all, greetings to all the participants, the panelists, and the experts who have joined this session today being organized by Rare Diseases India Foundation. Indeed, it's a very important subject. Until unless I did not speak to you, I was not into it. But uh, once I spoke to Saurabhji, then I tried to research this subject. 
And I think at the end, I would also share that we will try to explore a possibility of the Rotary Foundation trying to explore a support in this uh, initiative. And it becomes all the more relevant for discussion post COVID. So thank you to Saurabhji and the team RDIF for taking forward this mission on supporting the rare disease patients and creating outreach and awareness, enabling the support from stakeholders, including the donor community, the corporates in the public sector. Alone, we are rare. Together, we are strong. Collective action is a must for transformation. For quite some time, uh, different stakeholders, uh, I have been uh, into this for not a very long time, just two, three days back when I spoke to Saurabhji. So we've been reading all this stuff that quite some time, different stakeholders have been demanding for a comprehensive policy for prevention and management of rare diseases. The field of rare diseases is very complex and heterogeneous and prevention, treatment and management of the rare disease has multiple challenges. Every diagnosis of the rare disease is a major challenge owing to a variety of factors that include lack of awareness among the primary care physicians, lack of adequate screening and diagnostic facilities. Rare diseases are also difficult to research upon as the patient's pool is very small and it often results in inadequate clinical experience. I think that's very, very relevant in the context of rare diseases. Availability and accessibility to medicines are also important to reduce morbidity and mortality associated with rare diseases. To address all these challenges, a very comprehensive national policy for rare diseases, 21 has been finalized by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare as spoken by Saurabhji earlier after multiple consultations with different stakeholders and experts in the area. And thanks to our former health minister, Dr. Harshwardhanji, we have worked with him in the Rotary Foundation also very closely. India adopting the national policy for the rare disease in March 21 is a welcome step in this regards. The rare disease policy is a very comprehensive policy to lower, aims to lower the high cost of the treatment for rare disease with increased focus on indigenous research with the help of national consortium to be set up with the Department of Health Research, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare as the convener. Increased focus of research and development and local production of medicines will lower the cost of treatment for rare diseases. The policy also envisages creation of national hospital-based registry of rare diseases so that the adequate data is available for definition of rare disease and for research and development related to rare disease within the country. The policy also focuses on early screening and prevention through primary and secondary healthcare infrastructure. Screening is also supported by the Nidan Kendras set up by the Department of Biotechnology. Policy also aims to strengthen tertiary healthcare facilities for prevention and treatment of rare diseases through these designated and the health facilities at the center of excellence. I think there's a support of one-time financial support of five crores for upgradation of the diagnostic facilities. Uh, provision for financial support of up to 20 lakhs under the umbrella of Rashtri Arugya Nidhi is proposed for treatment of those rare diseases that require a one-time treatment diseases listed under group one in the rare disease policy beneficiaries for such financial assistance would not be limited to bpl families but the benefit would be extended to about 40 percent of the population under the pradhan mantri jan arogya yoji besides the policy also emphasizes a crowdfunding mechanism in which the corporates and individuals will be encouraged to extend financial support so here the the crowdfunding uh, platforms are a very good support for the rare disease patients, or for that matter, any, any uh, situation arising out of any patient for any disease. A uh, couple of them I am aware of is uh, Impact Guru is doing a very good uh, work in this space, especially in the healthcare. The needs which arise out of emergencies and the amount is quite big and the patients are not able to afford. So we will discuss this in details later on. Funds so collected will be utilized by the Center of Excellence for the treatment of all the three diseases. Uh, so there's a scope for a consortium putting a requirement on the crowdfund platform or individuals also can put their needs on the platform. The financial support should improve in qualitative terms. Rare diseases have received scant attention as earlier touched upon by Dr. Snehal also in the public domain, even more so in the current scenario owing to the pandemic treatment for these diseases where available tend to be expensive and recurring, making it unaffordable for many. Budget for these diseases provided by the government through Rashtri Arogya Nidhi 
important to note here is the budgets allocated to this component for 1819 and 1920 was 7.5 and 25 crores respectively however no funds were released in 1819 and 1 1.5 crore was released in 1920 this raises two concerns. The funds allocated are low. A second more puzzling concern is that utilization is quite low as well. I think despite of the high demand for the funds. However, on, the RAN only provides for one-time grant of 15 lakh as treatment support at government hospitals for specified rare diseases. Is the low allocation of the funds that does not even meet the minimal treatment costs a deterrent to the utilization? Another reason for such low utilization could be lack of knowledge of the rare disease and availability of such funds. It is clear that the patients suffering from rare diseases are not getting adequate support. Given that the health is a state subject, I think the onus of elevating this falls significantly on the state governments as some recent high court judgments prove it. Indeed, the states such as Kerala and Karnataka have established a state level corpus to mobilize funds for treating the rare diseases in addition to the central funding. Another solution could be allowing the rare diseases to be part of the company's CSR spend, the pharma companies. I think this is to be noted and we can explore a possibility of many pharma companies that manufacture medicines for rare diseases and can be asked to share the burden too. Creating awareness, which is the most critical. The second problem with the awareness about rare disease also stark. Available evidence suggests that patients in the US and UK take an average of 7.6 and 5.6 years respectively to receive an accurate diagnosis. Typically involving eight physicians in India, it may take even longer. The policy assigns the responsibility of creating awareness about rare diseases to the health ministry. To close this awareness gap, it is important to train existing doctors and not only the rare disease, but also on the funds available for the patients. One sustainable model to achieve this could be a public-private partnership. I think most of the solutions for larger problems are solved via this route, which has become very engaging in current times, where the private sector provides the knowledge based on the years of experience and research, and the onus of planning and execution of the programs is provided by the government. This might be another great opportunity to rope in the pharma companies that are involved in rare diseases discussions into partly solving this issue. Finally, incorporating the rare diseases as part of medical curriculum is important to train the future doctors. Several countries, including developing economies, are looking at ways to support patients suffering from rare diseases, with government support being a key feature. It is clear that along with augmenting funds, a structured approach on how limited resources are utilized is the need of the hour. A thematic study, impact of COVID-19 pandemic on rare disease organizations and patients across 10 jurisdictions in the Asia-Pacific region. I think the result of this study was the focus group meeting discussed differential impact across jurisdictions and point towards telemedicine and digitalization as a potential solution which constitutes a sustainable model in times of pandemics and beyond. 88% of rare patients offered a telehealth appointment during COVID-19, accepted it. 92% of whom said it was a positive experience. Also under the CSR law, the Schedule 7 of the Companies Act, promoting healthcare, including preventive healthcare, is included and eligible as CSR in a project mode and with measurable impact. There is a need for in engagement of the private sector in filling the gap that presently exists in extending quality health care, largely generated by the resource constraint and competing health priorities to those suffering from rare diseases in the country. Through this forum, we collectively appeal to the corporate associations and public sector units to contribute generously to the cause of treatment of the patients with rare disease under CSR initiatives. I think I'll stop here. We can have more questions in Q&A on the funding opportunities, which we can explore. Thank you for your patient hearing and thanks to the organizers for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you Mr. Sandeep. Um, uh, and uh, thank you for your views. So um, I uh, have a uh, few points to discuss maybe uh, taken as questions. Like uh, in this rare disease policy, if we see there is uh, also importance given for screening and prenatal diagnosis and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So whenever we focus rare disease, people usually focus on treatments where uh, many of the diseases yet treatment may not be available. So treatment is maybe a very small part when it comes to rare diseases. 
a large part of funds are required for basic investigations like mri and uh, enzyme chemistry and all these things and genetic investigations where funds are required and uh, it is usually not focused on and uh, we we want to focus on treatments but unless this diagnostic wing is uh, strengthened people don't come uh, forward for diagnosis uh, and uh, of course prenatal diagnosis there is nothing to support uh, where it comes to family support in terms of family screening and prenatal diagnosis where lot can be done before the disease is there in the family or you know lot can be done for prevention so how funds and projects can be done in this area which will go a long way for prevention and early diagnosis i feel and also screening and uh, all this uh, because small investigations they never come under any anything you know they they are not supported and in india we don't have uh, very big uh, pay, uh, takers for insurance policies yet so small small things patients have to uh, spend from their pocket like uhg like mri like enzymes and they cost a lot and genetic investigations before patient reaches up to diagnosis uh, they have already spent a lot so uh, and uh, the time is spent and uh, because the diagnosis is not there complications have already ensued so we have to also focus on these parts when it comes to funds and how to make up our policy funds from the, this point of view so i would like to you know have your uh, inputs on this so thank how, you how thank you Thank you, Dr. Snehal. You've raised this point. Uh, I think the prevention part is very critical, and the law talks about this. The CSR law talks about this in healthcare uh, in the Schedule Seven, and also the companies who support under the CSR ambit the rare diseases issues. i think they'll be happy to support in the early stages like for example rotary foundation we raise a lot of funds from the foundation as well as from the rotarians and apart from this we raise funds from the corporates mm. so the consortium we create the funds we create we do a lot of support on various issues like we do we have got uh, uh, the mammography centers we've got dialysis centers i think uh, this is something only once i've spoken with saurabh ji it's come in our ambit that this is also a subject where we need to talk more about it and explore more opportunities on supporting so diagnostic i appreciate is a very very important step in this as a first step and it, it is covering the preventive side of it so the early you are able to diagnose it and early you can actually look at the solutions for it and and within the ambit of the csr and within the ambit of the rotary international where i belong to i think there are a lot of opportunities is just a question of going to the right people and proposing the needs which are being looked at so a proposal will be the first step or a concept or maybe you can share one we can share it with the rotary to start off i think those are the things which companies would also look at supporting at the end of the day you are actually supporting the entire healthcare supply chain as a first step when we strengthen the diagnostic side of it uh, have i have i answered your question Yeah, yeah, of course. So we have this, and then I had few uh, things like uh, supporting academic activities. Now, Mrs. Sarov is there. We have Bosch patients. We have patients where enzyme therapy is there, but uh, the cost is very high. So how to you know organize this at various centers? Because I come from private uh, sector doctor, and there is a lot of gap when it comes to tertiary centers. Cost at tertiary hospitals. patients of uh, patient cannot visit government set up in our vicinity because lack of diagnostic facilities and specialties right. so as you said public and private how much goes to public and private partnership so how these models you know through rare, rare disease foundation only can guide us i feel and also to support to make up registries for different diseases which will go in long way uh, in few years uh, time uh, if this data is right from uh, now if it is we, we start making up uh involving various districts or uh, some uh, government fa facilities then this data will uh, form a backbone when uh, india actually uh, steps into treatments and clinical trials i feel so that also needs to be support supported and planned i think you yes you have raised a very relevant point here uh, the data is very critical because of a small pool of the rd patients 
the data is not much available but when we put together a proposal we need to show the data the needs and how this is going to be impacting the community called the rare disease patients who need to be served by all of us you know so the, the question is how do we put together a nice proposal which goes to the donors to support this cause i am very positive about it that there will be a lot of donors who would come forward and support healthcare has become a priority post covid everything is towards health and education so i think we stand a very good chance today to put together the proposals on the research we have within the maybe the uh, your foundation saurabh ji the rare diseases foundation and we can actually approach lot of corporates because this is the time when everyone is looking at health as a priority and covid has kind of opened eyes for everyone that the health infrastructure not only for rare diseases for anything and everything is not enough yes seeing the number of people who have to be catered actually at the end of the day whether it is the primary health care centers or the tertiary health care or the private sector hospitals and uh, and uh... we see rare diseases as rare because of the numbers but uh, right. everybody after post covid we will realize that how genomic sequencing is really supporting infections now so had it not been that research so advanced depending on the rare disease data and rare disease uh, this this research only has supported now genomic variations and sequencing right. and education so because we have made progress in rare diseases we really are you know based on that data and research we can really progress into common diseases also so it is interconnected and um, inter supportive i right feel so it's not that sure. we can think only for rare diseases it is supporting common disease database common disease research Uh, making a common disease vaccines and infections right. antimicrobial resistance so a lot of things uh, they help each other we have any questions uh, mr saurabh in chat box or any of the viewers if you have if you are able to see no there are no any questions in the chat any box any questions you received no questions Okay, can we proceed? Yeah, Dr. Atmu can tell something. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, yeah, before I start my presentation, just uh, uh, to take take the cues from Snehal ji and uh, Sandeep ji. So primarily, uh, right now I am also involved in MBBS teaching, and uh, uh, initially we see there is a aversion in a medical students for the complicated biochemical pathway that underlie the uh, metabolic disease and also. from the start they have a idea that this is very complex this is hardly you can find there is no need to actually they mug up for doing mcqs so in aims we have done few things like we uh, screen movies like the one movie i can say is extraordinary measure that uh, de dealt with uh, pompe disease so how a father who had a child with pompe disease he actually made a pivotal role of uh, developing the enzyme replacement therapy for pompe disease so many of our student become very interested in uh, that pathway by going to learning by going from that and uh, this national medical commission also they have started the idea of doing electives right now and both clinical genetics and molecular diagnostic there are two electives uh, uh, topics are available the main problem is whether those facilities are available so that the student can perform elective so if we have a uh, uh, idea that for each state at least one or few centers are there for the student can visit for a month and do the electives in these subjects i think that will uh, go a long way for increasing the interest in students so that the diagnostic odc of the uh, patients can go down they can get a easier diagnosis uh, the clinician uh, tend to uh, think of more those diseases when they see this kind of children and also i was also involved in uh, this uh, uh, icmr funded national rare disease registry so when the national rare disease policy was made in 2017 and there are some uh, obstacles came that time the icmr formulated that registry but because it is a hospital based registry so somehow there is a possibility that we can only touch the tip of the iceberg so i thought that there needs to be a comprehensive way so that we do not miss out those uh, uh, patient who are dying early on at the because of the disease or they might have a very milder illness so uh, the patient who are actually going uh, reaching the hospital in the tertiary care hospital very few of them if we are only going uh, to make a registry that doesn't reflect actually the burden of the disease than the economic uh, consideration for example the uh, uh, snail madam told that the 
if we want to do prevention by career screening and all, then how, what is the economic burden and what will be the benefit? So how much uh, in economic terms will save if we do uh, comprehensive career screening for diseases? So for that matter, I actually uh, wanted to uh, perform a study. So this just take uh, 10 minutes to share. Can I share my uh, screen? Uh, yeah. So it is showing that host has disabled. Can you enable? So we are not able to see your screen. No, uh, here it is uh, written host disabled participant screen sharing. So yeah, can, can somebody enable uh, share screen for him? So while uh, uh, the share screen thing is being sorted out, so uh, basically uh, in uh, genetics, we uh, uh, deal with large data set and uh, there are population data, data set available from which we can actually estimate the carrier frequency for these diseases. And uh, 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 unfortunately in India, uh, those kind of uh, databases are right now very small in size. There is a genome Asia database that only have some uh, 600 Indians whole genome data available. Uh, 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 for everyone, uh, but because these are very rare uh, mutations, so in 600 individuals, rarely we find the same. So in US, actually, there is a larger database that is known as the, uh, in, based on Broad Institute, uh, that is known as NOMAD, and there are a few lakhs of South Asian uh, whole genome data is available. So from the data, when I uh, uh, did a systematic approach, there are 221 uh, genes which are uh, uh, responsible for autosomal recessive inborn of errors of metabolism. So actually I uh, downloaded the data of all 221 genes and then uh, I have to uh, select which are the mutation which will be pathogenic. So basically I used uh, open source uh, data, uh, published literature and all. So from that I can find out for each gene what is the uh, frequency of carriers. So when I did that analysis for South Asians, the top top uh, 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 disease that was uh, responsible for inborn of metabolism was congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and then uh, uh, in in uh, uh, then there was excuse me, sir. sir are you uh, unable to share the screen? No, I'm not. Uh, I'm not able. It is showing. Sir, what, what is showing? It is showing host disabled participants in share. What, sir? It is showing host disabled participants screen sharing. Host disabled. Okay, one second, sir. Dr. Dutta, meanwhile, you can speak. You can uh, you can speak while by you. Uh... Yes. Uh, so uh, in our analysis, I'm not going into uh, very gory details. Uh, uh, the top top few were uh, in India. Surprisingly, was uh, neurodegeneration with brain iron accumulation, then pyridoxin deficiency, sideroblastic anemia. Then we had phenylketonuria, albinism, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, glycogen storage disease type two, biotinase deficiency, etc. So definitely there is a overlap between the common inborn error of metabolism uh, between different ethnicities also. Then we try to look at what is the uh, uh, the fraction of our population who are carrier for at least one inborn error of metabolism. So in South Asia, actually it is quite low. Uh, we found that only 3% of uh, uh, population are carrier of inborn error of metabolism. Whereas in uh, Askenazi Zoo, it is so high as almost 48% of Askenazi Zoo there career for a inborn error of metabolism. Uh, but the thing is that uh, the, uh, the uh, consanguinity is uh, not uniform across the South Asia and also in India. So there are states where the consanguinity is much higher. So those pockets, the uh, rate of uh, uh, prevalence of inborn error of metabolism will be much more higher. And then we also looked at the live births of uh, children with inborn error of metabolism. So for South Asia, it came to almost four four uh, children per 10,000 live birth who had at least one inborn error of metabolism. 
and that translated to almost 20000 live births per year in south asia with uh, inborn error of metabolism and many of what, many of those are actually treatable so here comes the role of the society as well as the government to how to actually treat those children who, who have a preventable or treatable disease so for today's talk i, I actually looked at uh, the uh, uh, the lysosomal storage disease also so uh, the topmost lysosomal storage disease i from my analysis in south asia was the pompe disease lysosomal storage disease type 2 and second is hurler disease uh, mps1 third is Gossett disease. So in our uh, clinic, we, we tend to see more Gossett patients and they tend to respond good uh, uh, if non-neuropathic to the enzyme replacement therapy also. So the thing is that because Pompe and uh, Hardler, they are more uh, lethal. So maybe we are not getting those children in our clinics for at the right time for therapy. Um, uh, so that, that was a very small uh, uh, presentation I wanted to make. Uh, so here also, uh, when I'm uh, using the databases, there are actually few paid databases. So around uh, uh, one lakh fifty thousand variants are still there, where I am not able to uh, uh, estimate the pathogenicity, whether they are pathogenic or non-pathogenic. So for that, I need certain funds. So if, whatever uh, uh, estimate I have, uh, uh, I have came up with, that is actually the lowest estimate. The this prevalence cannot be lower than that, but it can always be more than that. So if I'm able to resolve more uh, variants and also I can increase the database, then I have a more robust uh, 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 estimate of the prevalence and uh, carrier frequency of inborn error metabolism, also the lysosomal storage disease in South Asia and India. And that we can approach the government for a systematic way, that which is the topmost uh, three or five diseases. So how the national strategy should be there for de developing therapy, developing uh, diagnostic services for this disease. So thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. Datta. Uh, and uh, yes, so from your study... So I, am, uh, I am able to share the screen now. Can I just run my slides now? Yes. Sir, one slide to share screen now, sir. Yes. Is it visible? My slide is visible. Yes, sir, visible. Okay. Okay, yeah. sir. So uh, this work was also done in collaboration with the Global Genomic Medicine Collaborative and uh, uh, my head of the department and one MBA student is also uh, involved in that. So our uh, background and objective is to uh, generate a disease burden database for uh, uh, treatable rare disease like inborn error metabolism. And for that, we uh, used a statistical method that we uh, know as RD Winberg equilibrium. I'm not going to uh, that discussion today. So uh, there are 221 genes which are responsible for recessive inborn error of metabolism. So recessive disease are where the, both the parents has to be carrier for the patient to develop the disease, as opposed to some other disease like the uh, hunter disease, so it is an excellent uh, uh, recessive disease. So we are not uh, discussing for those disorders. They are not in our database, only for autosomal recessive diseases. So this is the uh, uh, work we've done. So these many, almost 1,73,000 variants are there. And we narrowed down to ultimately 8,067 uh, pathogenic variant in 212 genes. There are almost 1,50,000 variants. We are not able to uh, classify them as either benign or pathogenic. That needs a little bit of funding, maybe 1 or 2 lakh rupees for some paid databases. So the, the, if, if, we, if we have more variants coming from this to here, then the prevalence will again increase from that. Also, if our sample size increases, then also our uh, estimate will increase. So whatever estimate we are giving is the lowest estimate. The disease prevalence cannot be lower than that in South Asia and India. So uh, the, these are the uh, disorder I already discussed. So we all, all, we all of us know that phenylketonuria, albinism, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, plaquenil storage disease, biotinidase, these are very common diseases in all ethnicities, so as, so as to in South Asia also. The carrier frequency for South Asia are comparable for other parts of uh, uh, world also. It is uh, only Ascanese disease has very, very high uh, carrier frequency. And uh, for uh, South Asia, it is almost three per uh, uh, hundred population is a carrier for inborn metabolism. So for carrier, it is not a very small number actually, it is quite high. So for uh, for example, for uh, in West Bengal, we say that 8% of the population is a carrier for beta thalassemia or E beta thalassemia. So it is almost one third of it or uh, one fourth of it. It is not a small problem in West Bengal also. And then uh, the 10,000 live birth, the estimate is South Asia. 
is uh, almost uh, four uh, children for 10,000 life. But again, if I uh, able to uh, analyze more variant and classify them as pathogenic or benign, this will increase. So uh, if we compare different ethnicities, these are the diseases which are common throughout the world. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia, albinism, Gosset, PKU, etc. So if I concentrate on uh, LSDs, the top three are uh, GSD2, uh, Mycopolysaccharides uh, 1, or Hurdler and Gosset. So though in, in the clinics we see more Gosset, maybe because Pompeii and MPS1, uh, they die out before they reach us. So uh, the carrier frequency for LSD combined, it is coming 37 per thousand and birth prevalence is uh, 30 per million. So that is my estimate. Thank you. Thank you, so if any question or anything, I can take. Sir, your presentation was really uh, wonderful. I am very happy to see this presentation here. I have one question. Yes. Uh, patients initially uh, Yes, sir. Dr. Sora. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Datta. Yes, so, uh, what uh, we gather from your data, and to simplify it, uh, we have Mr. Sandeep Saxena, we have many participants, maybe from non medical background. What we gather from your data is it is such a diversification of diseases. Even if carrier frequency is less in India per disease, we have, yes. because of high population, very high burden. First thing yes. is that. Second is, uh, there are many uh, complicated facets in the research, like you get some variant, you are not sure whether it is disease causing, you need some support by doing enzyme studies yes. or some biomarker studies, which are available in some of the other country. You know, patchy lead is available in some of the European countries or USA and you're not able to access. Yes. There may be lack of collaboration, lack of sending samples, because there are so many sample specifications when it comes to sending samples and expertise. So there are, these are, and because numbers are less, it becomes very difficult to convince authorities why do you want funds in this, right? So yeah, it becomes absolutely. difficult that you have a few patients, uh, but if such, report, such uh, research is supported, it will go a long way to develop as a model for other diseases. Like I said, that we have uh, corona vaccines and we, we have basic research with genetic, which supported all this corona research and education now. We have a pool of uh, genetically trained individuals now who can talk on corona genomic variations because there are already work being done. So similarly, at least few of the models can be supported even if numbers are looking less, which on which other disease models can be developed. At least some such research um, consideration should be done by fund raisers or the people um, who can, you know, uh, see where, where the funds can be supported. The other things for patients and their families, which I want to, uh, I, which I've already stressed that family screening and the lack of clarity in families and patients and community level that where should they approach for funding. Uh, we are um, formulating this policy. We know that some of the, like we have nine centers in India, government centers, which will uh, get access to this rare disease policy for crowdfunding. Uh, patients can go there in, to that institute and that institute will upload the patient data and the agencies will come into picture. But this the message is not populated uh, to many of the doctors, many of the NGOs working in periphery and particularly to patients and families. So we need to get on to hands on to many NGOs who are working with specially disabled children, autistic children, where chunk of the diseases are actually metabolic diseases and genetic diseases. Uh, so this may be uh, looking from their point of view, very simple support they may need. They may need a just a rehabilitation support. Say uh, oculocutaneous albinism will need just ophthalmological support for studying, you know, now because we have online education, uh, albinism child can perfectly uh, mentally normal. So may need only online support for education to go ahead because of vision problems. Uh, that, that may look simple for the authorities to fund that why they need, you know, they can arrange. 
so there are small small problems and the basic and very difficult task for a rare disease foundation people working like us that how to formulate small small projects uh, so that we can present it to funding authorities and develop some models one in research area one in uh, rehabilitation area one in diagnostic area one in screening area and one in treatment area and one in management even if treatment or is not there in some of the diseases management by orthopedicians managed by rehabilitation management in say osteogenesis imperfect of managing fractures in an oi child uh, even if oi doesn't have a specific therapy some bisphosphonates and fracture management goes a long, long way the child will be perfectly uh, you know quality of life will be better so here uh, it may not fit, fit into rare disease habil rehabilitation program it may be just orthopedic management but it still comes under rare disease because there are repeated fractures and so much of expenses so uh, there has to be uh, i am um, uh, what i have to what i want to say is to uh, ms saxena and ms saurabh is that we have to have these models in four or five areas i have mentioned uh, prevention screening uh, diagnosis research treatment and rehabilitation develop few of the models present it to front fund raisers uh, at which uh, areas crowd funding can have help us and um, on top of it awareness awareness in medical community awareness in non medical community so medical community right from student uh, age uh, into the curriculum and uh, specialists and various doctors uh, through education programs and non medical community involving many ngos many community people working with, with such patients many companies like uh, pharmaceutical companies and foundations so we have to really gather them together uh, over to you mrs saurabh um, how how do you look at it and mr randeep uh, sandeep saxena how do you look at it um, uh, ways to suggest how we can get together this so that we can utilize uh, crowd fundings and uh, csr funds uh, in a better manner so uh, saurabh ji can i come in so as you mentioned about the screening the diagnostic and the management and the preventive the first level of interventions needed i think it is all covered under the csr in the schedule 7 the second one we talked about is on the research and development that also is under the csr and i think the first target for support on the csr front is the large pharma companies and and we we should also look at creating a think tank in this space where the stakeholders from pharma companies from rare disease foundation certain ngos certain other individuals who are focusing in this space or institutions i think we should get together and kind of put together a proposal or a need and share with the authorities in terms of a collective effort Yes. and pharma companies for fundraise should be the target because there are huge foundations in the pharma sector who are doing lot of work already in the csr space and this space i personally feel is neglected and all of us together can strengthen this yes thank you yeah so i think mr saurabh to rare disease foundation or foundation like this who is at an apex state Uh, can really recognize uh, from various fields who you can uh, gather together for uh, making research projects, and then uh, depending on that data, how to uh, convince uh, people that where the funds will be more utilized properly uh, or should be prioritized. See the preventive part is sort of the one minute longa. Yeah, please. Who preventive? हम बात कर रहे थे अभी प्रिवेंटिव इज वन ऑफ दी वेरी वेरी स्ट्रॉन्ग प्रायोरिटीज इन ऑल दी प्रोजेक्ट्स फॉर फंडिंग बिकॉज इट हैज अ लॉन्ग टर्म इम्पैक्ट एंड दी नंबर इज बिग वेयर इट इज इम्पैक्टिंग राइट एंड यू आर सेविंग लॉट ऑफ मनी ऑन अदर इंटरवेंशन इफ यू आर प्लेइंग राइट एट दी प्रिवेंटिव स्टेज सो सी एस आर लैंडस्केप इज वेरी हैप्पी आई थिंक टू सपोर्ट दिस बिकॉज आई बीन फॉर अ लॉन्ग टाइम एंड आई अंडरस्टैंड दी माइंड सेट ऑफ द पीपल हु सिट ऑन द टेबल एंड अप्रूव दी प्रपोजल्स प्रिवेंटिव the proposals who would target on the prevention side would be very happily accepted and the government of india has now included even the research and development 
So I think uh, that's that's a good landscape to focus and start off this initiative and try bringing people together on a common platform so that our voice becomes stronger and then we can actually push it. And this is the right time to do it. Thank you. Sarabji, over to you. Yes, sir, you are uh, very right. Actually, for all these things, awareness is very much important because uh, a patient sitting in uh, remote areas he is not aware about the diseases. Not even the doctors in remote areas and rural areas, doctors are, are, have never seen the rare disease patients. Whenever a patient goes to the visit the doctor, the doctor calls all the juniors and all to just look at this patient. This is the first patient of this hospital, like this, because. Doctors are also not aware. So diagnostic centers everywhere is very much important. And pre-diagnosis is very, uh, very, very much important for rare diseases because we, there, from there, we can uh, save the financial burden uh, because once we diagnose the patient, the burden will be very less. And one thing, Mrs. Sora, which I want to, because I work in private sector, Nine centers have already been designed, uh, designated for Redis policy. So, what way we can approach uh, or, you know, uh, this policy, how we can be supported, how we can be guided when uh, it is still to come where sometimes we are working small private sector, sometimes we are working in tertiary hospitals. And because they're corporate hospitals, sometimes uh, it, it's, it, it, it is taken as that, you know, they are not initially supported. So how, how, to, how to get connected uh, in the private sector till, till some rare disease policy comes and looks at us? Because many specialists sit in the private, uh, these hospitals and patients are directed from a community there for specialist advice. And then uh, what happens is, uh, like, suppose a clinical diagnostic facility is not available in, uh, in the vicinity in government hospital, patient is directed to tertiary hospital where the charges are high. Uh, the facility is not available at uh, the government center nearby government, even if it is a big hospital, government hospital is available with us. But just because it is a private hospital, patient uh, prenatal diagnosis genetics doesn't come in the insurance purview. Uh, prenatal diagnosis is such an important uh, aspect in prevention of genetic disease in that particular family. It becomes difficult for the family for financial uh, support. So, how to get you know how to get these things together, uh, especially in private sector for us? Yeah, Doctor Atmu want to say something? Yes, uh, sir. yes, ma'am. So uh, right now in uh, West Bengal, this uh, uh, this national disease policy they have created a center in IPGMR and SSKM hospital. So, uh, uh, in AIMS, if you see, uh, suppose I see a child with a Gossett disease. So, I just uh, make a diagnosis, confirm diagnosis with enzyme assay with the help of uh, company support also, pharma support. And then a genetic, sometimes confirmation also with the CSR support. So, after that, I just apply uh, to the, uh, there is a board, rare disease board of the hospital. So, they don't, uh, the patient doesn't need to go and show uh, in the OPD again. Just goes with the letter with my signature and all the reports and apply to the director of the institute. So, so when every month they have a meeting, so in that meeting they take up the case and decide that based on the national disease policy, the patient fits in which group. And based on that, they, they are creating a registry. I'm not very sure they have started fully functional supporting the therapy as yet, but the registry they have started maintaining. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so again, we have to direct to a government center. You know. Yes. Uh, the the rare disease policy has made like that. It is like a uh, tired approach. So initially, they have to reach one of the uh, centers, and yes, finally, we will send. I'm just saying that how we can start doing projects at private hospitals, so that you know, yes, slowly, slowly, yeah. once that private hospital presents and does such projects, slowly, uh, this policy can be expanded, which is already there in the policy that they want to expand yes. their centers of excellence slowly. So how to build up this uh, support and data and research and uh, screening aspects at an, uh, at this uh, centers of excellence so that uh, soon if we present this data, such centers of excellence can be taken up further into over few years. Yes. So the uh, DBT, uh, the Department of Biotechnology, they have uh, established few Nidan Kendras. 
So in that they train the faculties. But yeah. right now it, it says the faculty from a government medical college, government yeah. institute. Yeah. So definitely they are leaving out private uh, for now. But I think after some time the government will get saturated, and then uh, I think it will open up to private also the Nidan Kendra. And uh, are not all the uh, all the expertise is available in all the hospitals. No, like liver exactly. transplant, very few centers. Bone marrow transplants, very few centers. So definitely, uh, it cannot be multiplied sometimes because of the cost and expertise. So sometimes it is needed at that particular hospital. So it will come slowly. Yes. Yeah, I think we need to uh, approach the funding agency to change the only uh, right now they are training only the government hospital faculty. That has to change. Yes, over to you, Mr. Saurabh, if you have a few of the inputs or uh, Mr. Sandeep Saxena. I think all the topics has already been covered by uh, Mr. Saxena, Dr. Atilu and you. So I'm uh, very grateful uh, the presence of, by the presence of Mr. Ratan Sandeep Saxena, Dr. Atilu and you. So, Thank you so much. Any more questions uh, from anybody's side? My, anybody, if, uh, if, uh, if you have received Mr. Sarva earlier, a few questions or any doubts from parents or uh, the organization working, if you have, if you want to raise here, or Dr. Datta, any of the questions remaining? I don't think uh, there are uh, any, yeah. So, yes, so to summarize, this was the, this was the maybe initiative meeting where we discussed role of CSR in uh, rare disease policy. And uh, now henceforth, uh, Mr. Saurabh, we need to focus on the areas where CSR exactly how it will help, either in public spaces or PPP spaces. So we have to uh, make conversations specifically on some of the areas on research, treatment and prevention and uh, develop that kind of conversation with various stakeholders in further future meetings. Based on this meeting, I feel, so from uh, this meeting will guide for the conversations that to involve many groups uh, who will uh, come into CSR support and also uh, to uh, take benefit of CSR. You know, we want beneficiaries also be involved in these meetings so that uh, they can also guide us uh, that uh, what areas we have to more explore on. So thank you, um, Mr. Saurabh, for arranging this meeting. Thank you, Mr. Saxena, for your uh, guidance. And also, we need uh, inputs from all the CSR um, aid uh, makers who will guide us uh, for how much and how to explore these partnerships. Uh, thank you, Dr. Atanu Kumar Bhatta, for this data and uh, showing the complexities involved in diagnosis and research and how we go ahead from this. Uh, and it was a pleasure attending this meeting and we look forward to more of these converse conversations happening, which will really help this disease policy to spread further to real beneficiaries. Thank you. Thank you so much. We can leave, I think, Mr. Saurabh, yeah? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Snehal. Thank you, Dr. Tano. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you.